Hi there, everybody. I'm Brian Whitmore. I'm a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council's Eurasia Center. Welcome to our report launch today for Oil, Gas, and War, the Effects of Sanctions on the Russian Energy Industry by Vladimir Milov. It's the latest in our series, Russia Tomorrow, Navigating a New Paradigm. The Russian economy, as is often said, rests on two pillars, oil and gas. And if that is indeed the case, the Russian economy should be in very deep trouble. But that does not appear to be the case, at least for the moment. But as the author of the outstanding paper we're launching today will show us all, appearances can be deceiving. Since Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine in February 2022, the United States and its allies have imposed thousands of sanctions on Russian corporations, financial institutions, and individuals. The most significant of these have targeted Russia's hydrocarbon industry. So what was the effect of Western sanctions on the Russian energy industry? And how has the impact differed between the oil and gas industries? What role is LNG playing? How, how have Russian budget revenues been, been impacted? What steps has Moscow taken to evade these sanctions? And what can the West do to plug the gaps? These questions and more are all addressed in Vladimir Milov's excellent paper, Oil, Gas, and War, the Effect of Sanctions on the Russian Energy Industry, which we are launching today. Not only was this paper a pleasure to edit, but it was also very educational for me. I learned a lot, and we all hope that you all will learn a lot from it as well. The author, Vladimir Milov, of course, requires very little introduction, but I'll give it a shot anyway. Vladimir is the Vice President for International Advocacy at the Free Russia Foundation and the former Deputy Energy Minister of Russia. I'm going to turn the floor over now to Vladimir for a 10 minute summary of his paper, and then we're gonna follow this with a discussion with our expert panel. So take it away, Vladimir, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Brian, and hello everyone. Uh, very happy to do this, and I think uh, these issues need uh, a lot more detailed look and uh, scrutiny of the nuance that uh, is currently being done in the Western expert community. There's a lot more to see uh, to actually make the sanctions more effective. I will not run through all of my paper, feel free to read it, but um, I'll just focus on three major sectors which I think uh, constitute this uh, Russian export-oriented oil and gas empire. I'll start with the Gazprom, uh, not in the order that that was actually presented in the paper, but because Gazprom recently has been making a lot of headlines, generating the first uh, annual loss uh, after 2023 in a quarter of a century. And this is exactly, I've written this paper some time ago, months before this uh, recent financial results were reported, but uh, I was making this point that because of the loss of the European natural gas market, Gazprom will have to look for a totally new business model uh, to sustain itself and make its business profitable. And we clearly can see that uh, it, uh, find, it is finding some hard time making ends meet because uh, Chinese market is not nearly that attractive uh, as uh, former sales to the European Union. I have to make a clarification here because... Um, what Gazprom facing is not necessarily sanctions, because there were actually no sanctions introduced against Russian natural gas. But what happened is probably a de facto sanctions regime, because uh, in 2022, Gazprom had voluntarily suspended many of the uh, supplies, and the European Union member countries, uh, gas-consuming countries, have decided actually not to ever turn back uh, to purchasing any gas from Gazprom. So it's not formally sanctioned, but de facto it's uh, pretty much the same. Uh, it will be extremely difficult, if at all possible, for Gazprom to find a new model for profitability, uh, because expanding gas exports to China requires massive investments uh, into building new infrastructure, which does not exist at the moment. Plus, uh, what we know about uh, Chinese uh, gas exports is that uh, since its inception five years ago, Gazprom were not able to make them profitable. We only know this indirectly because it never reported financial results of gas sales to China, but which is also a telling factor anyway. But uh, what we do know is the, the gas supply price to China have barely reached uh, $300 per thousand cubic meters in the past five years. Most of the time it was significantly lower than that. 
But 10 years ago, when the gas contract with Gazprom was signed, uh, the, the level of price which was mentioned as uh, guaranteeing at least minimum profit was 350, 380, significantly higher than the actual price that uh, uh, Gazprom has been supplying gas uh, under. That means a lot of factors actually have shown in the past months and years that Gazprom is basically selling gas to China at a loss. And now I think we have something closest to a material proof of that with this uh, financial reporting for 2023, because China eventually became a largest consumer of Russian pipeline supplied natural gas. And that coincided with uh, extreme losses, uh, about 14 billion US dollars uh, overall loss from the core natural gas, gas business. That was somehow softened by uh, profitability of other sections of Gazprom, which is oil, electricity, and so on. But the core business uh, related to natural gas suffered extreme losses, uh, and that is clearly related to uh, inability or, uh, for supplying gas to China at a profit. This will, if, if Gazprom is to expand supplies to China, which is a questionable thing in itself, because clear, clearly China doesn't need this extra Russian gas. That is discussed in uh, uh, detail in the paper. I'll, I'll leave it up for further discussion. But uh, many experts have been pointing out that Gazprom's long-term natural gas balance is pretty much saturated. They have indigenous production. They have LNG. They have imports from uh, Central Asia and Myanmar. So basically, there is no niche for this extra volume uh, of Russian gas to be supplied through Power of, power of Siberia 2 or whatever. But if that ever happens, if that new pipeline to China is built, it will be much longer, much more costly than the, the currently running Power of Siberia 1, which means that there is very little chance that Gazprom will be able to derive uh, any profit at all. So to those who are saying that sanctions are not working, here we have like minus one a major donor of the state budget actually is not uh, capable of um, delivering profits anymore. Gas Gazprom still is pretty heavily taxed, which is why some of the experts would say, yes, all of this is good, but they still deliver a lot of money to the budget, but not for too much long, uh, because it's clear that Gazprom simply has been overtaxed in the past few years against uh, the, the loss of profits from the European market. One of the reasons for loss of last year is an additional windfall tax imposed by the Russian government to finance the war. So it's going to get harder and harder to take the money out of Gazprom in the medium and longer term. The other thing is oil industry, where the picture is very, very different. Uh, compared to Gazprom, it's doing like more or less okay uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, first, uh, in the Russian oil industry, we have to understand that uh, the actual lifting costs, production costs at wellhead, are very low. Yes, they have transportation, but we're talking about like single digit figure in dollars, like three, four dollars uh, on a wellhead maybe. That means uh, if the oil, in, imagine it is not taxed at all, even at the $30 per barrel, uh, Russian companies can still make profit uh, exporting oil because of the actually very low uh, production costs. So the major burden and the, ma the major suffering because of the decline in oil prices is borne by the budget, not by the oil companies. Companies can continue operating and exporting the oil, but uh, the system of taxation is such that when prices are higher, it is the budget which receives more revenue, and when the prices are lower, lower it is the budget that uh, is losing more. That's the that's the formula. So Russian budget suffered significant losses again, as I show uh, in the paper, because of the sliding oil prices because of the embargo. Uh, as a matter of fact, to make a long story short, uh, to balance uh, the the federal budget for this year, twenty twenty four they would need Euro's export oil price well above $70 per barrel. They are barely getting there. Essentially, prices most of uh, the beginning of this year were lower. So uh, the budget is simply making ends meet in terms of uh, oil revenue. However, the oil industry was capable of redirecting the trade flows towards Asia. That is disadvantageous in a lot of ways because uh, oil sales to Asia come with huge discounts. Uh, 
consumers, they are basically awaiting Russian oil that cannot be sold to Europe anymore and saying, yeah, okay, we can accommodate these volumes, but please give us a discount. The other thing, and this is actually why Russia was never exporting oil in major quantities before to places like India, it is extremely costly. Over a month of uh, shipping oil by tanker from Black or Baltic seaports to India, plus you have to pass through all these bottlenecks like uh, Suez Canal, Bab el Mandeb Strait, uh, Gibraltar, and, and so on, Danish Straits, where you do have significant delays, bottlenecks, and uh, uh, companies have to pay demurrage for delayed uh, supply and, and so on. So it is significantly more costly to ship oil to India. You face significant discounts, but you still make some profit. So at least oil industry is delivering uh, some of the money to the state budget. Here is the question that clearly oil price cap, the G7 oil price cap is not working. There's been some improvement in its enforcement lately, but Russia is selling well above the price cap. It's a long debate about what to do to make it work. But my recipe is uh, investing in enforcement capacity hiring professional staff to actually monitor, scrutinize tanker ownership, transactions, uh, uh, shippers, traders, uh, insurers, uh, and so on. That's a lot of paperwork, but it is worth it because I think it, the, the oil price cap is uh, enforceable if more capacity is created to specifically handle this uh, large uh, export volumes. And I'll stop with LNG. Because uh, that's not big compared to overall exports of natural gas uh, through pipeline or uh, seaborne crude oil. But still, uh, remarkably, Russian exports of LNG have been not sanctioned yet. And actually, it was thriving in the past couple of years since the full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Europe had greatly increased uh, purchases of Russian LNG. And on one hand... LNG, unlike Gazprom's pipeline gas, is almost not taxed because Novatec, the main producer of LNG, is essentially exempt from most of the taxes. However, last year we saw um, Putin signing into law amendments to the Russian taxation code, which allow government to impose one-time windfall taxation on companies that made lucrative profits uh, in the past uh, years. And Novatec here is a primary target believe me, there will be a moment when they will take all this extra money and extra profits derived from LNG exports to Europe to actually uh, uh, increase the budget revenue and increase the ability to finance the war. We're not there yet, but the odds are very, very high. So sanctions about Russian LNG has been in discussion for ages, but nobody is doing really anything uh, to, to, to embargo that. I think that is necessary to be done. I'll stop here. We'll be happy to hear a discussion and, and questions. But one last point is that, uh, like Brian, we have been discussing that uh, we, whether Russia is still an energy superpower after all the sanctions, embargoes, and, and so on. It's struggling to remain so, but this superpower suffered a great wound to the head, uh, and we can do more. There are ways which I specifically outlined to to increase the pressure so that uh, Putin's uh, oil and gas revenues will dwindle, it is possible to do. I mean, we're going there, but we're not there yet. Great. Thank you, Vladimir. And I, I want to just stick with you for a very brief thing to, to, to clarify. Um, as we're looking at sanctions and we're wanting them to, to, to hinder Putin's ability to wage war, the thing we should be looking at is budget revenues above, and, uh, above all. And your explanation, both as I was reading the paper and as I was listening to you speak now, of how the taxation system works, right? And how when there are high oil prices, those profits basically are taken by the taxation system. When prices are low, they don't. Do you see, I'm not really a tax and economics guy, but like a way where Putin will be able to extract more from the oil industry as he, as he needs to be. Can, can this formula be, be tweaked, I guess is my question. Uh, yes, he, he can extract more, but this comes with a price. There is a flip side to it. And uh, how this was done in the previous uh, decades was brilliantly described by Igor Gaidar's book, The Death of the Empire, 
when the oil prices crashed in 1986, ultimately contributing to the collapse of the Soviet economy, there was a huge debate inside the Soviet government because uh, Russian oil industry was essentially begging to leave some of the profits uh, to be able to reinvest them as capital expenditure because uh, the, the matured Western Siberian fields were getting more and more depleted and it required heavier investment to keep them running. But Gorbachev had basically denied them that and took the money away to try to maintain the budget afloat. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was a major mistake because since 1987-88, uh, within like five or six year span, Russian oil output had almost halved because of underinvestment. So Putin, yes, he can take some extra windfall profits out of the oil industry, LNG and other industries as well. But this will hurt capital expenditure in, an, in the medium term, significantly harm uh, the output. You cannot escape that because there are no other sources to finance investment. Uh, interest rates by central bank are prohibitive. Uh, financial International financial markets are, are closed for Russia and so on. So profits is the only lifeline. Mm. If you slash them, uh, that means less capital investment. That means less output in the medium term. Great. Thank you, Vladimir. And now I want to bring our, our expert panel in. I'm going to introduce them first and then go to the first round of questions. Anders Osland um, is, is somebody who's well known to everybody. He's a senior fellow at the Stockholm Free World Forum. I happen to be in Stockholm at the moment. Um, Olga Hakova is the deputy director of, of for European Energy Security at the Atlantic Council's Global Energy Cent Center. And Aura Sabatis is the senior is a senior energy journalist for independent commodity intelligence services. The first question I want to ask to each of our panelists: um, We're all old enough to remember when Vladimir Putin uh, would tell everybody who would listen that Russia was an energy superpower. And for a long time, he seemed to be correct. Moscow was able to use energy as a weapon against its foes and as leverage against the West. Is, and Vladimir alluded to this at the end of his talk, but I want to throw this out to the panel. Is this idea of Russia as an energy superpower dead, given Gazprom's woes? Um, and Europe, Europe's reorienting, reorienting its energy mix and Russia's increased dependence on markets in China and the global south. Um, I want to go to you first, Anders, since I'm in Stockholm and you're from Stockholm. Thank you very much for the invitation, uh, 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 Brian. And uh, uh, I think that this is an excellent report that uh, Vladimir, as usual, has uh, uh, presented. And what I take out of it is uh, two big uh, uh, conclusions. One is the sanctions work, and the second is that the sanctions need to work uh, uh, much uh, uh, better. On your question, is Russia's uh, energy superpower? I think that uh, Vladimir has shown well that Gazprom is broken, but while the oil sector is not. And what is not discussed in the report is the uh, uranium uh, and uh, nuclear sector, which is uh, not broken. So uh, let, let me <clears throat> uh, sum up what uh, I see as really important. First, uh, it's uh, Vladimir's conclusion, sanctions work. He you looks upon it uh, in terms of uh, state income. And if we take oil and gas, they account for half to two thirds of Russia's uh, export, depending on the uh, price. When price, uh, oil and gas prices are high, it's two thirds. When they're low, it's uh, half of uh, uh, export revenues. And uh, uh, about half of uh, the uh, state revenues, which uh, Vladimir shows uh, has been uh, much less known. Now, and uh, the strong evidence that sanctions work is that export revenues from uh, 2003 uh, to, 2000, uh, to, to 2003 fell from uh, $628 billion to $465 billion. That is a fall by 26%. I'm using the Bank of Finland uh, statistics here. And uh, the aim should be to get it down to a bit more than $300 billion. That's how we really tighten uh, the belt on uh, Russia. 
And then uh, another point um, that uh, Vladimir points out very well is that uh, sanctions have become messy. They are too unwieldy. They, uh, uh, and the obvious conclusion is they need to be standardized and uh, coordinated and uh, re reinforced, that is uh, being said. And here I have five recommendations that I would uh, like to emphasize. Uh, uh, Vladimir has said three of them, and I would like to add two others. The first uh, uh, recommendation is introduce prohibitive import tariffs on all Russian exports to the West. The EU is doing that now for food from Russia and Belarus, do it on everything. Since Russia uh, no longer is treated with most favored uh, nation uh, tariffs, uh, the uh, uh, bounded tariffs are up to 50%. That is prohibitive and impose them all over. Then we get rid of all these strange loopholes. As Vladimir mentioned that Novatec is basically not taxed, nor are any import tariffs imposed on it. And to whom does Novatec belong? Well, of course, Putin's good friend, Gennady Timchenko. But I think that Vladimir is right that it will be taxed now. Because Team Checo seems to have lost out in the inner circle, but that's a, a different um, argument. Impose uh, serious uh, uh, tariffs on it. And then a second measure, uh, what uh, Vladimir does suggest, sanction uh, L uh, Arctic LNG2 and uh, Novatec. There's no reason that uh, uh, this uh, uh, should, uh, should uh, be outside of sanctions. The third recommendation, sanction Rosatom and uranium uh, exports. Uh, Hungary and France, that have a lot of cooperation with Rosatom, have been against it. Until recently, also the US. Uh, about one fifth of uh, the enriched uranium that the US uh, has imported comes from Russia. This is impermissible. That's about $1 billion uh, uh, a year. Now the US has adopted uh, sanctions uh, uh, against it. Europe uh, uh, should uh, follow. And uh, 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 fourth uh, sanction that should be introduced is quite specific. Sanctioned Schlumberger. Uh, the oil service sector. The other companies have uh, uh, Halliburton and Baker Hughes have probably withdrawn. We don't quite know, but it seems that they have basically withdrawn. While Schlumberger is uh, thriving in Russia, this is impermissible. So hit Schlumberger uh, hard, uh, prohibit uh, uh, oil service uh, uh, generally. That's one big way of reducing uh, uh, the Russian oil sector. And then finally, what uh, Vladimir touches upon, uh, hit uh, the unsafe uh, shadow fleet. 90% of Russia's oil is exported through two uh, <clears throat> closed um, uh, seas. The Baltic Sea, 50% and 40% uh, uh, through the Black Sea. And they are then going through the Danish Straits and through uh, uh, the Bosphorus. And this is simply, from environmental reasons, completely unacceptable. They should, the shadow fleet should be prohibited for those reasons. So thank you very much. These are my five recommendations. They are quite close to what Vladimir suggests. Thank you. Thank you, Anders. You managed to answer both of my questions before I asked the second one. <laughs> but um, but that's, that's great. Well, let's turn to Olga. What are your thoughts on this? Thanks so much. Great question. Being an energy giant is so much more than having resources in the ground. And of course, sanctions do nothing to what Russia's capabilities and what capacities in terms of oil and gas reserves, critical minerals, and other energy critical supplies uh, that Russia has to offer. But to continue its role as an energy giant and survive the backsliding of its, uh, of its market share, Russia will have to figure out how to have its future without the level of 
relationships, allies, and with a tarnished reputation. Being an energy giant is just as uh, is just as about maintaining those supply chains, maintaining those long term partnerships, and being able to even some of the most advanced, biggest energy giants out there. They rely on technologies. They uh, they rely on solutions, whether it's tech or actual you know physical tools from other countries, um, U.S. including in a lot of different ways. They rely on ta talent and workforce and best practices. Uh, energy giants don't live in a vacuum and just export energy. So in some ways, uh, some of this loss will be extremely challenging to recover. Now, of course, let's pretend that um, Russia tomorrow is a democratic country with democratic leadership that wants to re-engage back with Europe and other allies around the world. I don't see the 40% in case of gas, for example, the 40% market share returning. However, if there's a certain change in leadership in the way Russia behaves, especially with its neighbors and how it chooses to behave following the, uh, its aggression in, in Ukraine, there could be some voices in Europe interested in re-engaging, but there are also some countries that have beyond learned their lesson. And no matter what Russia does with its leadership, with internal reforms, with promises and uh, the way it treats Ukraine following this horrendous war, there are some countries who will never want to rely on Russian resources ever again, if, if they can help it. Um, but you will have some players because economics are really important and competitiveness in Europe is really important. You will have some traders, you will have some players that will look into on what it looks like to re-engage with Russia. Now that's the best case scenario, which I wanna be optimistic uh, and I'm hoping that we can all work towards that, but that's the best case scenario. Other alternative scenarios look very different with Russia continuing to lose its influence, its market share. There will be, if we continue escalating these sanctions, there will be delays. Let's take a look at LNG development, for example, Arctic 2 and other projects. Russia will eventually figure out how to do this on their own, even without you know, Western technologies, but then Chinese technologies that have helped them tremendously. But this will be a lot more expensive and it will take longer. We're talking five to eight years in delay. Another important component to remember here is that the world, you know, Europe, um, U.S. and other countries are figuring out how to get to net zero by 2050, and so is the oil and gas industries. No easy answers, but those conversations are happening, those innovations are happening, and instead of investing into how to decarbonize its massive oil and gas resources, Russia is investing into aggression in Ukraine and other countries. So it's it, it could also miss the train to figure out how to make its supplies lower carbon competitive, Let's take a look at CBAM. Oil and gas is not impacted by the carbon border adjustment uh, mechanism that will be introduced in stages initially, but that's on the horizon. So within, you know, within the next several years, decade or so, we're likely to see oil and gas being part of that uh, of CBAM and countries that can showcase transparency, um, they can showcase clear carbon accounting, they will be more competitive versus Russian supplies too. So huge, massive opportunity cost for Russia to be choosing this aggression rather than you know, tapping into its robust, rich, incredible energy resources and investing that into its society. Um, I don't know if you want me to comment on the report in this round or in the next one on, on the recommendations, let, let me know. Yeah, no. Let's save that for the for the for for, for the second round. I'm I'm, a, I'm an old radio guy, and when you're an old radio guy, you look at the clock all the time, and I'm watching the clock really closely because I want to make sure I leave time for audience questions. Aura, to you, um, is Russia's dream of being an energy superpower dead? Uh, well, uh, as, as Vladimir's report has uh, pointed out, the uh, Gazprom um, and also the oil industry has suffered, uh, has taken lots of hits. We've seen it translating into massive losses, $7 billion uh, losses. We've seen Gazprom losing market share. Currently, they are now covering less than 10% of the total imports in Europe. Um, and um, also there are now plans to ban uh, transshipped LNG, Russian LNG uh, in Europe. Um, 
that said, the report actually doesn't go, and I would have wanted very much to read a little bit more on this, the impact of these, um, these losses on the internal economy in Russia, because we've seen short-term borrowing uh, for Gazprom nearly doubling, and that could put tremendous strain on Russian banks. That's one thing. The other thing is the fact that, that the Gazprom cannot sell gas to Europe means shut-ins. So what impact will this have on uh, the geology, on the, the actual reserves, the reserves that Russia has. Long-term impact, does it mean that Russia will ever be able to export uh, uh, gas and to, to use these reserves? Um, the social impact, because um, Russia has been relying on gas sold to Europe at market price to finance a system of cross subsidies internally. So uh, it, it, Russian consumers in the longer term may not be able to benefit from cheaper prices. So what will that mean for the society itself? Um, but in terms of Russia, actually, so we see on the one hand the weakening of Russia as a uh, as a gas superpower, as, as we saw it and as we knew it. Um, but on the other hand, I would like to give you some very concrete examples to show you that Russia can actually still wield that energy weapon against Europe. Um, and that's reflected in a couple of issues. Number one, the fact that there is still transit going through Ukraine uh, to Europe. Everyone in the business is watching what will happen to the transit because the agreement is coming to an end um, uh, on the 1st of January 2025. We're not talking a lot of gas. It's only about uh, 14 billion cubic meters of gas, but it's still something that could move the market either way. So that's one thing. The other thing is the fact that there are still some longer term contracts in place. For example, the Slovak gas transmission system operator Ustream has a long term transit contract until 2028. They would very much like to see this transit happening because they get the money, uh, even if the transit is reduced, they still get the money uh, for, for this contract. It's a, it's a ship or pay uh, type contract. Um, then, and that's the biggest elephant in the room, um, uh, is the, 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 a spate of contracts, I think uh, um, um, 12, 15 companies, European companies have uh, contracts under arbitration with Gazprom. I remind you that in 2022, Gazprom cut gas supplies to Europe, um, and many of these buyers were forced to take Gazprom to uh, arbitration. Now, we're talking here 70, 80 billion cubic meters of gas. We don't know what will happen to this gas. Um, only yesterday, there was a breaking news that one buyer, one company, Austrian company, I think you all know who I mean, um, uh, said they faced the risk of gas supply cuts, um, Russian supply cuts, um, because um, uh, following a, a court decision, um, um, they will have to pay a European company, which presumably has won this court case, uh, rather than Gazprom itself. Now, this could mean that Gazprom might cut the gas. We don't know what hides behind this. It's, it's still a very fresh story, but the bottom line is that it has moved the market by about 20% from one day to the other. So you can still see that even though the, the volumes of gas, of Russian gas that entered the market in Europe are, are very, very limited, the perception of the importance of Gazprom in the market is so big and that the companies are still so worried about what could happen that it can still move the market to a very large extent. And then on the oil side, although oil is not really my specialist field, but on the oil side, I would say that the fact that Russia works together with OPEC, so we're talking here OPEC plus, and they decided on supply cuts has led to an increase in oil prices. Um, so you can see the influence of Russia even there on the oil market. Um, so I, I just wanted to, to highlight these issues to you because I think it's very important to show how Gazprom and how Russia is still influencing the oil and gas markets despite this reduced role, which is probably likely to, to reduce even further. Thank you, Aura. That was great. And I want to kind of going to go one more round of questions to to 
to the panel um, and to Vladimir before we turn to our audience. Um, I'm watching the clock very closely. Again, old radio guy. The clock is a dictator. The clock is also your friend. Um, so to everybody, I wanted to, Vladimir suggests a series of steps to make the oil price cap much more effective. These include increasing the number of professional staff permanently dedicated to monitoring Russia's, uh, Russia's export oil shipments, introducing secondary sanctions against third party, party insurers, traders, and shippers who are helping Russia evade the price cap, and finally improving the mechanism of attestation of transactions um, to ensure compliance with the price cap. I wanted to... Um, get you to all just very briefly react to how politically viable these recommendations are and are they sufficient? Or why don't we stick with you for the moment, then I'll move to Olga. Anders basically answered this in his first answer, so. Um, yes, I, I agree with Vladimir's conclusions. Uh, perhaps these uh, the, these checks could be carried out and outsourced to companies that actually track the oil market so they, they don't necessarily have to hire new people they could hire a consultant a consultancy or or companies that specialize specifically in uh, in tracking the oil market um, sanctions would be very much or secondary sanctions would be very much welcome on on banks um, and on the gas side i would also like to highlight and i think vladimir mentioned this in the report and i'm very grateful that he does i would like to highlight the fact that a lot of gas and oil is actually laundered through turkey um, um on the on the gas side uh it's it's sort of whitewashed and sold um as azeri gas or iranian gas or even as lng because turkey is now importing lng and recently it has signed a deal for about 5 billion cubic meters to 0.5 million tons um of lng with exxon mobil um so you know there is no way of checking the origin of the molecule mm -hmm. it, it, I suppose, technically, chemically speaking, there there could be a way to track the origin of the molecule, but right now there is absolutely nothing in place. And um, if you read uh, lots of stories coming from Southeast Europe, you will see that there is uh, many regional companies are saying we are buying gas from Azerbaijan, but hang on a minute, how much gas does Azerbaijan have ultimately, right? Um, and how much more can it actually bring online? Because the demand is way, way, way exceeds uh, the, the ability to supply this gas. Uh, so where actually is this gas coming from? And the suspicion is that the gas is coming from Russia and it's whitewashed either in Azerbaijan, either in Turkey and sold off as Azeri gas, as LNG, et cetera. Um, so Turkey should really be held accountable. And Turkey always likes to, to negotiate things in a package. So uh, perhaps when uh, the European Union uh, discusses the next customs union with Turkey, it could throw in many things and condition the negotiation and the, uh, the expansion of the customs union on, um, on actually monitoring the origin of this gas and being a compliant partner. So uh, this is this is definitely one of the issues. And then potentially going forward, and I'll stop here, uh, consider also the, uh, the sanctions on pipeline gas. Great. Thank you, Or As you're speaking, I couldn't help but uh, recall the old Russian expression, or money doesn't smell, meaning you can't trace the origin of money. Maybe gas doesn't smell as well. Um, Olga, your thoughts? Thank you so much. I agree with the report's key recommendations and Aura's uh, additional details around how to create more transparency. And just a couple of additional thoughts here. Um, when it comes to the shadow fleet, which we know has played um, a huge massive role enabling Russia to be able to bypass some of the Western uh, services, lessons learned there. The fact that a lot of these older ships that were meant to go to the scrapyard, uh, especially based on their value at the time, uh, were sold by European uh, countries, owners, um, and we did not use that as an opportunity to either, you know, tax them, make it more, even more expensive. Russia paid premium for these ships um, just to be able to get access to them. So looking into the future, they've pretty much built out their fleet. Uh, I don't think they're going to be going massively after too many additional ones, but there could, there could be some additional demand. So ensuring any future ships that are coming, that are being sold by European buyers, there's got to be some kind of a tax, a fee, uh, just making it more difficult, more expensive 
uh, for the European sellers uh, to uh, for the for Russians to access these additional ships. The reason why I'm not saying you know ban sales completely because Russia would figure out a way through multiple layers of companies to get to those ships regardless. So we might as well create a transparent, expensive me uh, mechanism for Russia to get to any future ships they invest in. And any billions of dollars they spent on building out the fleet, um, maintaining that fleet, creating insurance mechanisms, that's money going away from attacks on Ukraine. And just broader transparency around the, the shipping industry, uh, specifically the shadow fleet, um, these ships, you could have them flagged in some country like Marshall Islands. You could have the owner live on the other side of the world. You can have the operator be in a completely different space. You can have the insurance company. When you have this many layers of uncertainty, there are opportunities, and this is being discussed in this late uh, 14th uh, sanctions package around how Europe can utilize its powers of its, you know, its waters and tracking what's happening in its waters to demand more transparency uh, to refuse services to these ships and just, again, make it more expensive, make it harder for Russia to operate this shadow fleet. Anytime it has to go through an extra distance, that ex and, we, and other speakers have um, uh, addressed this as well, that's an additional fee. Every every penny uh, that's going towards operational costs, is go is that's not money not spent um, on atrocities in, um, in Ukraine. And another specific areas, and this is kind of a larger scale, uh, we should not self-deter in terms of talking about what we won't sanction or will sanction or you know what it will take. Let's keep everything on the table in terms of energy sanctions, um, because I think in the past we have been so transparent and uh, just really uh, exposed our sanctions strategy, which has allowed Putin to leverage then his response to it as well, saying, oh, well, they won't go after this export or they won't go to this extent because this will threaten energy security or supply security. Uh, this is an interesting time. Let's leave everything on the table. Let's not you know, leave our cards out and exposed and, and show them to Putin. There's a lot of additional things that we can do on tightening this. Um, and I think one of the most important points uh, is also just the way we communicate effect effectiveness of sanctions and also the criteria and we uh, other speakers address this as well the criteria and the measurements by which the success should be uh, you know should be uh, explained and measured I think there there's the simplified expectation that you sanction and Russia stops aggression in Ukraine Russia's in you know massive energy industry we've talked about this in the first questions where you know them being this massive energy giant this this massive uh industry has been developing for decades if not longer and for us to say okay a couple of layers of sanctions are going to automatically within a few days or months make it takes time and sanctions have been impactful but there are additional ways to to make them harder to evade. And that's what we're talking about today. And we need to do a better job of communicating the wins, of being able to help people understand the metrics. So, you know, it's not just revenues or just the, this metric, the implications for Russia, for Russia's future uh, and its economy, they go a lot deeper, they're a lot more complex. And we need to find a, a more successful way of conveying those success stories, because I don't think the, the ask and I don't think the explanation to an average energy user consumer, I don't think we have been as successful in that as, as we could be. Brian, you you're muted. Me? I know, thank you. Um, sorry about that, I accidentally muted myself uh, when I didn't want to, uh, I was trying to unmute myself. Um, Vladimir, uh, now that I've just wasted a couple of your minutes, um, do you think you can give us your final thoughts um, before we turn to audience questions, responding to our panelists um, in about two minutes? Um, uh, well, uh, first I have to say that I'm happy to hear that colleagues agree with a lot of my policy recommendations. And I think we got to switch the attention a little bit because I see a lot of commentary not necessarily in this discussion but uh, people get sort of fascinated enchanted by how cleverly Putin and his Oilers are inventing all these clandestine schemes oh smart people and so on this is not what we should be saying there's no time to cheer that uh, all of this specifically should lead us to a uh, conclusion like let's create this task force to specifically trace uh, what kind of tankers they have 
and what we can do to make them seize the operations because we saw that uh, US government was partially successful in grounding down some of the Russian tanker fleet so we can obviously do more. So my best advice is to shift this from just generally discussing how successful Russia is in promoting some evasion schemes to uh, actually doing something about it and beefing up the enforcement capacity, just as I said. The other thing I wanted to pick up on what Anders said, and that's a huge issue, the environmental risk of this shadow fleet, because it is not regulated and not supervised anyhow. Nobody is interested. I've asked a question to some of my folks who I know for decades who are still in, in the Russian oil industry. I said, listen, but who operates? Who drives these tankers? Who services them? What is their condition? They said, you don't want to know. Uh, because really, they, they are hiring some third-class people who have basically zero skill about how to handle all this. Uh, believe me, we are not too far away from maybe not one major disaster involving this uh, shadow fleet, which is why I would uh, fully agree with what Anders mentioned. The regulatory measure needs to be taken to uh, actually do whatever possible uh, to forbid the uh, you know movements of this shadow tanker fleet, which is not regulated and not supervised through uh, territorial uh, waters of the European Union member states. The other important thing I would also pick up on this, uh, that's crucial, uh, the oil field service companies, whereas some of them have left Russia, Slumberger, SLB, continues to, to operate through its uh, Russian subsidiary and providing world-class services to Russian oil field companies. That is a huge issue because Russian oil fields are very complex matured many of them are really old and it requires a lot of like intellectual power and skill to ensure the productivity of the oil wells essentially i would say if slb completely leaves russia that would result in dramatic decrease of well productivity because nobody nor neither russians nor even chinese possess a lot of this techniques and knowledge about how to handle these complicated uh, oil reservoirs so it's it's a very important issue to not to overlook the fact that SLB still continues to operate and uh, do something to to make it quit. I'll I'll stop here because uh, that was I think uh, these were the most important points that I pick up from from what colleagues discussed. Great, thank you, Vladimir. And now I'm going to shift to uh, questions from the audience. And actually, we got one from Lori Veith that I actually want to know the answer to. I'm going to go right to you with this, Vladimir, and then get, give the panel a chance to respond. The question is as follows. The Biden administration has criticized Ukraine's attacks on Russian energy in infrastructure, but for the most part, those would seem to be focused on refined products and domestic storage facilities rather than port facilities, with a few exceptions and no production fields have been targeted. Can Ukraine's campaign possibly be causing Russia to shift crude production to the export market that damaged refineries cannot use? And would this counter the administration's concerns of global market disruptions by forcing Russia to increase crude exports and offsetting the decrease in refined product exports while at the same time cutting into domestic supply for Russia's war machine and war economy? That's an excellent question. Vladimir, what, what would you say to that? There is no basis for... Jan, unmute, please. I think there is no basis whatsoever uh, behind the claims that Ukrainian strikes on Russian refineries somehow hurt the international crude oil market. It's actually vice versa, because uh, less oil is refined in Russia. Where do you send it? There is no significant reservoir capacity. It, the crude will be sent to international markets instead, actually adding to the surplus, not the deficit. So I think to me, it looks like basically the, the US administration was kind of desperately looking for some sort of semi-viable explanation uh, on how to, to force Ukraine to stop uh, hitting uh, vital targets on Russian territory. The damage is significant. Uh, just yesterday, Russian Statistics Agency has uh, released the weekly stats about gasoline production. It's nearly 20% down compared to end February because of this uh, drone strike. So what Ukrainians are doing, they're taking out these high-end installations producing mostly high-octane gasoline 
these were installed mostly by the Americans or the Germans, and there is no replacement, nor even China manufactures that sophisticated stuff. So this, uh, again, I just don't see any major effect of these strikes on the international energy market. But for the Russian domestic gasoline market, that is significant. It already creates a lot of pressure, which is why to me clearly it looks not only a legitimate target, but a very clever way for you, the Ukrainians to cause disruption in vital uh, sector of the Russian economy, uh, basically, you know, not touching everything else. Does anybody else on the panel want to react to that? Um, Anders, Aura, or Olga? Yeah, yeah I, I just like have... To... Go ahead. <laughs> no, I just wanted to add that the reason why oil prices have gone up um, in recent months is not because of Ukrainian strikes on uh, refining capacity. It's because of production costs, which Vladimir mentioned in, in his report. So we've seen um, OPEC plus, so OPEC plus Russia agreeing on reducing uh, these production uh, targets, quotas. And it's it's been happening since I believe the end of last year. Uh, and it has absolutely nothing to do with, uh, with the Ukrainian strikes. And I want to compliment Ukraine's uh, strategy because it has minimal to non-civilian casualties and implications. They're not dropping down to Russia's war crime level. They're focused on economic implications for Russia with minimal market implications globally. Um, the fact that they uh, theoretically have access to 50% of Russia's refinery, there's no way they would attack all of them at the same time and have them be out of service at the same time. However, it creates uncertainty. It forces Russia to think about how to protect these uh, critical energy infrastructure installations. Um, some of that could then be, uh, if the, these attacks intensify, they could encourage Russia to move um, some of their military equipment to protect uh, to protect their wells, to protect the refineries, to protect other parts, and that's and that's less going into Ukrainian into Ukraine into towards attacking Ukraine towards uh, creating destruction in Ukraine. Um, I think it's a brilliant strategy. I think you, uh, Ukraine has a really uh, incredible opportunity to create uncertainty, make things more expensive for Russia uh, with minimal uh, global markets implications. Great, thank you, Olga. And we got time for a couple more questions, I hope. Um, we got one from Harley Bowser, who is actually gonna be an author of a later paper in this series. Harley asks, how important is the projected $450 billion loss for the coal industry this year? Um, this is a little bit outside the scope of the paper, um, but it does kind of touch on, on, on energy. Does anybody wanna, wanna, wanna tackle that? Yeah, my ears are mutual. Uh, if I may say a few words on this, coal industry is not a donor of the budget at all. As a matter of fact, is uh, indirectly heavily subsidized by very strong subsidies on rail transportation. So this 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 is an ongoing uh, debate between Russian railways and coal shippers uh, where to find the money to give them subsidized tariffs. So it is uh, essentially coal industry is more uh, uh, delivering certain profits to Putin-linked oligarchy. Uh, the recently appointed um, uh, energy minister Tsivilov who is married to one of Putin's relatives and so on. They've been making good money out of Kuzbas on all this coal production mm -hmm. and shipments to China. But the budget revenue from coal industry, to make a long story short, it's negligible. So uh, this really does not create any difference for, for the Ministry of Finance. Great. Thank you, Vladimir. I want, and I, I was unaware of this, but yeah, thank you for, for, for clarifying that. The, the coal industry is not a donor to the budget. Um, the question from Christine uh, Jelansky. Um, it's a bit broad, uh, but it, but I, it's, it is something that's on all of our minds. Uh, could you talk more about the social impact that sanctions are having on Russia as well, presumably talking about sanctions on the energy uh, industry, but also sanctions writ large. Is this having an effect on uh, on the social situation in Russia? Vladimir, I think this one's tailor-made for you to, to tackle. Uh, am I unmuted? Yes. yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, that's, it would take another 
many hours to discuss the social impact. You know, uh, social impacts means everything coming together. This is not just an impact of one or two uh, particular types of sanctions against this industry or that industry. As a matter of fact, all of the sanctions combined are basically resulting in uh, raging inflation, which central bank is not able to cool uh, even after almost 10 months of maintaining growth prohibitive interest rates. Plus, uh, Putin's uh, cash reserves are slowly but surely expiring. And when that breaking point comes, he will be on the brink of making the decision to switch to monetary emission, essentially printing the money to finance the war. That would exacerbate an inflation problem. And we do know from uh, examples of other countries and the history of my own country that persistent high inflation does create uh, social and uh, political tensions. So this is a kind of an integral effect of all of the above. And we are clearly moving in that direction. Mm. Anders, you're a close observer of the Russian economy. Do you have anything to say about this? Yeah, I wanted to add a, a few points there. Uh, of course, inflation is around 7% in Russia. And uh, uh, strangely, the interest rate is 16%. That's the central bank uh, 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 interest rate. And this is a very strange situation. Uh, and it can be uh, explained in a couple of different ways. One is that uh, uh, the ruble is under intense speculative uh, pressure. So you need to have a real interest rate of uh, 9%. Uh, I think that is uh, partly correct. Uh, but it's also, I think, that inflation is higher in Russia than is officially uh, admitted. Uh, for many years, I suspected that Belarus does this. It has had a high growth rate that is not um, reflected in any real uh, uh, measures. And I would guess that Russia now has, has gone back to the Soviet standard of two to three percentage point of uh, hidden inflation each year. And this would explain that uh, Russia last year had 3.6% uh, real group officially. I don't think it is, is uh, the reality. I think that this is a, a cheating uh, with uh, the statistics. And the big threat that we saw particularly in 2022, that was an enormous uh, uh, capital flight, officially of $239 billion, which is at least six times more than is usually the, the case. And you wonder why is... Uh, uh, capital flight legal in Russia today. You can uh, transfer uh, lots of money illegally. Well, because uh, Putin and his friends want to take out the money, as we uh, learned from the uh, Panama Papers and uh, uh, Vladimir and um, Boris Nemtsov uh, showed it very well in their report to, uh, from 2008, uh, Putin and, uh, and uh, Gazprom. So this really shows the kleptocratic uh, nature of the regime. And uh, the sanctions then squeezes uh, the, the upper class so that they take out more money because they feel that money in Russia is uh, even less safe uh, than before. Okay, well, again, I'm watching the clock and I see that we have less than one minute uh, left in our, our event. Vladimir, any last thoughts before I wrap it all up? No, basically, read the paper and there is a detailed uh, outline on what the West can do to enhance the sanctions. They are working, but much more needs to be done because Putin is somehow still struggling to make ends meet and he's partially successful. There are very specific steps. It was a fruitful discussion and thanks for the colleagues to outlining some additional issues to be tackled. We can do it. Uh, the West can handle Putin and can deprive him of uh, oil and gas revenue to help end uh, the brutal aggression and war against Ukraine. Super. Thanks so much, Vladimir. And I will reiterate your words. Read this paper. Um, it's a great paper. Uh, I should know I edited it. Um, it was a pleasure to edit, and I learned a hell of a lot from reading it. That about wraps it all up. I want to thank all of our panelists for today's discussion. And again, thank Vladimir for a truly great paper that truly taught me a lot, and I hope it teaches a lot of other people a lot as well. And thank you. That concludes our event today. Thank you.